Welcome to Game and Going Deeper, a podcast series by the Gamers Brotherhood, where we talk about personal development, mental health, and sexuality. We are your hosts. Michael Diorio is a life and wellness coach specializing in sexuality, relationships, and self-confidence. Reno Johnson is a spiritual life, love, and business coach. And I'm Matt Lancedal, a counselor and facilitator specializing in healing and empowerment. So we each have our own private practice, and in this podcast, we're sharing all of our best stuff with you guys. And today we're talking about gaydar, how to tell if someone is gay. And we're going to be exploring the two questions. How can you tell if someone is gay? And is there anything you do to make your gayness more known? And what about hiding your gayness? As usual, we'll continue these discussions on the last Thursday of every month in the Gay Men's Brotherhood Sharing Circles, where you'll have a chance to share your own experiences we also have our connection circles, which happen on the second Thursday of every month and are similar or smaller, more intimate breakout rooms where you can discuss the topics on this podcast with other members in our community. So you can go to gaymensbrotherhood.com and check out our event section to RSVP for either of those. If you don't have Facebook, you can get on our email list and we will email you the Zoom link. So if you go to gaymensbrotherhood.com, scroll down to the very bottom of the page, you'll see our um get on our email list form, fill that out, and you will be on our email list. Uh, this podcast and YouTube channel are listener and viewer supported. So if you enjoy what we're creating, you can support us by making a donation to the show using the link in the show notes. You can also subscribe to the early access option on Apple podcast, listen ad free, and gain early access to episodes. All your support helps us to continue making content for you and supporting our community. And we do thank you in advance for this. If you're looking at to accelerate your personal development journey, check out our coaching collection, learn how to heal and empower yourself at your own pace by getting instant access to 45 plus premium personal development coaching videos created by us, as well as our healing our healing your shame and building better relationships courses. You can head to gaymengoingdeeper.com for more information there. And if you're new here, please subscribe to the channel on YouTube. And if you're listening on your favorite podcast platform, please subscribe and leave us a review, which helps us get into the ears of people who need us. Oh my God. I'm, I've got a cold right now. And that was like my, yeah, my lungs are feeling a little bit, <clears throat> a little bit toasty. Um, okay. Let me freshen. I was just going to say kudos to you, Matt, everyone who's listening, who doesn't know Matt has a cold and he showed up today ready to yeah. go. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. What is Gaydar? So I sat with this topic, well, for the last two, three weeks, and it felt very basic to me. I was trying to find the meat in, in this. Um, it is an informal term. Um, it's not an actual term. It's kind of like a, uh, an informal term that people use to describe what criteria perhaps, uh, we can use to determine whether somebody's gay or not. There isn't a lot of research on this either, but I did find an article, um, that I wanted to share with you guys. And the article describes Gaydar as, um, the ability to determine whether someone is gay based on their intuition about the person. What we're talking about here are cases where people make inferences about others' sexual interests in response to minimal information, such as the way someone dresses, walks, or talks. Okay, that's what this article introduced. So um, Dr. Nicholas Rule, a social psychologist at the University of Toronto, published a paper earlier this year in the Archives of Sexual Behavior, in which he reviewed the accumulated scientific literature on this topic. Okay, so we're going to tag the the whole article in the show notes. So you'll be able to read it on your own, but I'm just going to read the two first paragraphs, you guys, because it's instead of me just summarizing it, I figured I would just read it because it's well-written. So basically uh, most scientific studies of Gator suggest that there's something to this idea. These studies have focused on very different types of sexuality cues. For example, people seem to be able to detect sexual orientation while listening to short audio recordings, but also while watching silent videos. In addition, they can detect sexual orientation from still images of faces that appear on computer screen for just a fraction of a second. These wide ranging findings suggest that Gaydar can potentially pick up on everything from one's looks to movements to speech patterns. These sexual orientation inferences occur very quickly and seem to reflect automatic responses. 
In fact, when people are asked to think carefully before making a sexuality judgment, gaydar actually becomes less accurate. In other words, the more people think about it, the worse their gaydar is. This, this suggests that we don't necessarily know what it is that we're basing these determinations on. Further evidence for this points for this point comes from studies in which people were asked why they made specific sexual orientation inferences. It turned out that they often lacked insight, especially when they only had very minimal information to go off of, such as a cropped image of a face that only showed a person's eyes, nose, and mouth. And it also goes on to say that some people have ha, or have more accurate gaydar than others. So the the instances where in this article goes on to say that the highest people score is about 64% of the time they're able to identify. So that's the highest, right? So there's always going to be assumption in when we're making these determinations. I think it's important to note too, that social conditioning plays into this in such a huge way. So there's, yes, there's, there's factors, but when we grow up and we are gay and we start to make peace with being gay, we might want to live the gay life and become more gay. So we act more gay. If we're hiding our gayness, we might become more rigid and less, you know, flamboyant. And we might, so there's, there's an, uh, there's an, uh, an element here of acting right like we are all actors and actresses we have a self-concept and we're portraying that self-concept to people so that plays into this as well so um the way we dress there's so many factors that come into this um and i i, I want to for, for you guys and for the listener i want to also point out that because when i was doing this all this research i was thinking about my gaydar me having gaydar of other people i wasn't really thinking about what about people's gaydar about me how does that influence me knowing that there's people in this world that might be able to intuit my experience? So I want you to think about that. Mostly this is going to be about, yes, we're talking about our own gaydar, but we want to think about being seen as well as seeing other people, right? And that these can be very different experiences and being seen by somebody can feel very vulnerable. It can feel very exposed, exposing. So I wanted to point that out. Um, and then unconscious bias, we did a podcast episode on unconscious bias. So that was, I believe, June of 2023. So if you go back and listen to that, there's going to be a lot of similar things in this episode, I think, that is going to bleed into that. So that would be a really good follow-up episode to, to watching this one. I, so I'll suggest that. So I think it was June 29th, uh, 2023, that that one was released. Um, yeah, okay. So looking at like what we see in someone else. Oh, I kind of broke it down into two categories. So what we see and what we feel, right? Like, for example, my gaydar, it shows up in the sense of how I see people, how they're walking, talking, acting, their mannerisms, these sorts of things. So that's going to be a piece. And then how I feel somebody, right? Like their soul energy, their resonance, my intuition, my gut feeling, right? So it's broken down into these categories. So under the C category, I put like personality traits, could be things that that give off um, information that you, someone might be gay. Physical characteristics or mannerisms could play a role in the things that we see in somebody and then how somebody responds to, to you. So are they checking you out, right? That might give you data if they're gay or not. Um, and then as far as things that we feel from people, again, it's like intuition or the resonance we feel with somebody. I know that when I'm with other gay men versus when I'm with straight men, I feel resonance. I feel like we have a similar vibrational energy. I can feel that, right? And uh, so energy and gut feeling, like the instinct that I feel around somebody. And that for me would be more my gaydar. Um, I, I tend to feel into people being an empath. Um and then lastly, I wanted to say too, like, I, I, I believe we have a creator. I'm still not sure what that is yet, but I believe we have a creator and I believe our creator doesn't create us without creating like, like attracts like, right? So we as, as gay men, I believe need some sort of survival instinct or adaptation that's going to give us information about people that we need to like with, that we need to match with or mate with or whatever you want to call it. So I truly do believe in Gator. I think it's an energetic form that we are able to come together and connect with each other as gay men. Uh, I want to also point out how vulnerable that can make people who maybe are listening to this podcast that are coming to terms with being gay and maybe they're still closeted and, and that could feel very vulnerable being around other gay people that you know might see my secret 
right? And I know when I was younger, I came out at 18 and, um, you know, being around other gay people was very intimidating and scary for me because I didn't want them to see the part of me that I had been spending 13 years desperately trying to hide, right? So it, uh, there's lots of moving parts and lots of facets to this once you scratch the surface. It took me a, a little while to scratch that surface because I was like, I can't get around this. And um, so, yeah, let's let's see what comes up in today's episode. I'm curious um, for, for you guys. We'll start with Michael. So um, how can you tell if someone's gay? Yeah, thank you, Matt, yeah. for that uh, informative intro and doing yeah. it well, sick. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, I want to... Going back, I'm glad you mentioned the unconscious bias episode. I want to kind of repeat something that we had talked about in that episode that I think is really important here too. And that was that um, our brains process our environment very quickly. And um, I think one of the data, one of the pieces of data that we found was there are, our brains take in 11 million pieces of information every second, 11 mm -hmm. million pieces of information around our environment. Of course, our conscious brain can't handle that. It can only take so much of it. So our brain takes shortcuts through the unconscious brain. And so that's why unconscious bias is such an important thing. So I think in this conversation about gaydar on the surface, you're right. We are talking about unconscious bias, assumptions, stereotypes, all these things. And I think it's still really important conversation to have. So mm -hmm. um, I will start off with a story <laughs> of how this kind of happened to me very recently. This was the last weekend. So I was at, I was in church last weekend. I don't normally go to church, but it was my nephew's first communion. And so I was at church and uh, the church where my brother lives is in the, in the burbs, I'm not here in Toronto. So I'm not in my gay bubble. I'm very outside of the gay bubble, like an hour and a half outside of the city. So I'm standing there in the pew while the priest is saying a sermon. And as I did when I was a kid in church, my eyes are wandering around, like not really paying attention. <laughs> And I'm just kind of scanning around, just wondering. And it's a jam-packed church. It was a first communion. So there's like two schools that were having their communion and all their families were there. It was really, really busy. And so I noticed myself sussing out the men in the room, not because I was like attracted to them and not because I wanted to like bone them, but just because I was curious. And so it, this was not conscious or deliberate. I kind of noticed it once we started talking about this episode, I was like, oh my God, I just did this. Um, but it was automatic. It was just this automatic scanning I wasn't really thinking, I can't even tell you what I was thinking exactly because it was very cloudy. But looking at it in retrospect, I, I was trying to figure out basically is who here is like me. Mm -hmm. Again, wasn't conscious. I can, only, I can only see that now. And some of the things I was looking at, what's he wearing? How does that suit fit? <laughs> How does he move? Uh, what are his mannerisms? I was looking at his hair. Is it nicely coiffed or is, is it not, right? So these are all some of the criteria that I use, right? Um, how he carries himself, how he walks. Um, if I can hear, like, what are his, what the way he speaks his voice. Uh, the big one, of course, is eye contact, right? Uh, gays sometimes just give each other that look. And again, it's not necessarily attraction, but it's like a, oh, I see you. Like, I get you, right? It's not like a, it's not like a, oh, I'm flirting with you. Look, it's a different kind of look. Now, is this absolute? Absolutely not. <laughs> Sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm wrong, but most of the time, in that case, anyway, I'll never actually know. Mm -hmm. And I don't do this just at church. I actually don't go to church that often, but I do this at the gym. I do this at the grocery store. I definitely do this at the gym. <laughs> mm -hmm. I do this walking down the street. It's just kind of like this, who here, it's like I said, who here is like me is kind of the, if I could put a thought to it, a conscious mm -hmm. thought to it, that would be it, but it's not conscious at all. And I think this is just a normal human tendency we have to, not just for gay people, but not just for sexual orientation, but to walk into a room full of strangers and to automatically suss out who here is like me, right? Regardless of regardless of what we're talking about, not with any goal in mind, but I think it's just a, a safety thing. That's what I think it is. It's just, okay, who here is like me? Who, who, who can I be drawn to? Who here can I, where's my tribe? Hmm. Um, and I want to add something, actually. We're talking about, you know, sexual orientation. So the way that I'm approaching it is like, how we interact in like rooms of hetero and homo people. But even within gay spaces, I still have a tendency to make assumptions based on limited data and just visual cues about whether someone's a top or a bottom, whether mm -hmm. someone is a scene queen, whether they're a slut, whether they're a new gay, whether they're one of those gays. I'm like, like there's just constant like <laughs> sorting and labeling that's happening kind of behind the scenes. I'm telling you guys, I'm not doing this consciously, but 
Oh, sometimes I am. But it happens so automatically. And again, it's the same kinds of things. Oh, the way he dances. Oh, he's dancing like a bottom or he's dancing mm-hmm. like a top or that drink is that, you know, he's having a, a what is it? A, a kind of beer. Uh, that must be a top thing. So these things, accurate or not, and they're not accurate, obviously. There's lots of people who, like, we know that this is inaccurate, but it's just interesting to see how my brain does that. And I would encourage the people listening here to do the same thing. Like I have my stories and I have my criteria, but some of it may be similar to mine, but I would encourage you to look at your own and how do you make those inferences? Okay. Because we can't ever tell. You can't ever tell for sure if someone is gay or straight. You can't ever tell for sure if they're a top or bottom or, or what their situation is. But because there's limited information, your brain will automatically take shortcuts and that's okay. Our brains have to take shortcuts. They do this all the time and that's, that's fine. And in fact, it saves us in, in many occasions. We kind of need those shortcuts to happen. You just have to know that they're not always accurate. Okay. Yeah. You got to become aware of those assumptions, become aware of those snap judgments, know that you're making it and realize, okay, this is, this is an assumption I'm making. Maybe it's right. Maybe it's wrong, but you don't want to necessarily act from that judgment. Yeah. And sometimes we can use those, those things. We can show up in a certain way because we want people to see us a certain way. Yeah. So I might go and grab a Corona from the, from the bar because I want people to see me as a top or as masculine or whatever. And I think, so there, there's, there can be truth. There can also be inauthenticity. There can be so much loaded in this. And I think the way around it is just get curious, ask somebody who they really are and take an interest in them as opposed to slapping labels. Yeah. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. That's, uh, um, that's a good, uh, little commercial for our, <laughs> our <laughs> unconscious bias episodes. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. What about you, Reno? What's coming up for you around all this? I mean, so obviously before we started recording today, I was mm-hmm. just like, y'all, I, I slid up in the DMS and I was like, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I'm struck. This is like one of the only episodes I've ever struggled to find my words around. And I think it's just because I wasn't, I wasn't connecting with, <clears throat> I guess, the, the topic and the questions. And you know, what's funny, as I'm sitting here and I'm listening, there's something I realized. So there's like some pieces to this. So there's the piece where like, I don't know that I've ever really, like, it, it's not to say that it hasn't happened, but it, I, I, I've, I've never really seen it being a priority for me. Um, it like seeking for gayness, I, I guess you could say. Like, I've always just kind of hung out with whoever I hung out with, and mm. to be honest, call me delusional, but I was just like, I just assume you're gay until proven otherwise like basically (laughs) my assumption was like I am if I want to sleep with you I might have a chance and it doesn't matter what you're wearing or how you're walking like if I'm into you you're probably going to know it and then we'll see what happens you might (laughs) punch me in the throat or you might like hop in the bed with me you know or 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 or, you know or both um you know not in that order um but but (laughs) but like yeah it was just it was really interesting because I was I was I found myself sort of struggling with like the 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 question and the topic and sort of how it's shown up in my life. I can certainly say that there are qualities and characteristics that I'm aware of that I would associate with a person being gay, but also not exclusively. You know, it's like I could say I could say like gay people wear shirts like the one Michael's wearing right now. Right. But it's like, but, but then gay people also I'm gay and I'm wearing this military vest and a hoodie and a matching military hat and you're wearing a gray t-shirt. Right. It's like, so, so how, what, like, what do gay people look like? Right. It's like, Mm -hmm. you know, gay people have like well coughed hair. Right. Or, you know, it's like, well, I don't know. Mine's kind of a mess and it's under a, baseball cat like so you know it, it it's so it's just it's really interesting I I find myself kind of struggling with the the topic a little bit and I think it's I could be wrong about this but I think I I sort of move through the world and um I take people at like face value kind of and mm-hmm. and y- y- how, how do I say this like what came through is like 
you are as I see you. And and also like I again I just think everyone's gay until proven otherwise, you know? Yeah. Like if we're if we're speaking in the context of gayness as like men being attracted to other men and this sort of being a filter to like who I might be able to sleep with, it's like everyone's fair game until you tell me the fuck off, you know? <laughs> so that that's kind of how I look at this. And I might be missing something here, but um but that like that's what's alive for me on this topic. And there's more I want to say later as well about about it. Yeah. Hmm. You know what's interesting is I'm the opposite of Urino. I assume unless I'm unless I'm in somewhere that I know is like a gay safe space that I'm aware of, but I assume the opposite. Everyone is straight until until proven hmm. otherwise. So right. yeah, like when I was in church, <laughs> I was like, I am the only homo in this place. Hmm. Right. But, I'm like everyone yeah. in there is gay. <laughs> y'all want to sleep with me or somebody, but you know, I'm like y'all are gay. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I think I'm more aligned with you, Michael. I had to think for a second there, but uh yeah, I would say, you know, for me, my unconscious biases, I've done a lot of work on these and I don't feel like I have a whole lot of unconscious biases anymore. I might have some biases and I might have some assumptions and some stereotypes that I favor, but I'm usually aware when I'm doing them. Mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest thing. Like I've, I've pulled enough of my stuff from my shadows into the light that I'm able to kind of work with it and see, and not saying that I'm like a being of light all the time. I'm saying that I actually have awareness of these parts of me that want to assume and judge and, and these sorts of things. Um, yeah. And also I'll, I have a story as well, before I go into like the sharing the little nitty gritty pieces, but, um, so I was in an authentic relating training, um, this past weekend in Los Angeles and there was, um, when it's different, like going from Calgary, where there's a lot of gay people here, but it's not like out, like people walking around being out, out gay, whereas Los Angeles is very different than that. And we were in West Hollywood for an afternoon and it was very gay and, and these sorts of things. So it gave me a little bit of like stuff to play with around this. But in the training, there was me, there was 26 of us and there was, I think, seven guys like you, Michael, whenever I'm in a, in a, a, a group like this, I'm always assessing like safety. That's just what I've done is from a child. Like I, who's safe here? Who would be somebody that would be like an anti-gay person? So that was my first step. And then I was like, who might possibly be gay here? Who could I like match up with and do some little authentic relating games with that we would have this as resonance with? So there was a guy that I thought for sure, 100% that he was gay and all the other ones I, I pinned down as straight. And, um, so <laughs> we, we had this thing where we, we stand in this big group in the circle and it was like, um, move towards somebody that you are curious about, that you're interested, you want to get to know more about. And this made me anxious. So I'm like, I'm going to let somebody come to me. I'm not going to go towards somebody. And, um, and guess who came over to me, <laughs> this guy that I thought was gay. And I was like, this is so interesting. So this is affirming. So this was the story I was telling myself. This is affirming my story that he's gay. He came over, he found the resonance in me, and we're going to have a conversation about what it's like to be gay and authentic relating. So he went first, and I think the prompt was like, uh, shit, what was it? The story I'm telling myself about you is. So he went and, and shared whatever. I can't even remember what he shared about me. And then I was like, oh, fuck, I'm like, am I going to go to this edge? Am I going to go to this place and like talk about the story that I have that he's the only other gay guy in the group and me too, because what if I'm wrong? And whenever I go to these authentic relating trainings, like I'm, I'm literally living on my edge the whole time and I'm just in this place. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to go for it. And I'm just going to be like, so I'm like the story I'm, I'm telling myself about you is that um, like me, I think you're gay and, and we share this as a resonance. And like, he was like, just like, whoa, I could feel like closure, like he closed off. So my intuition, I kind of have a feeling that maybe he was gay and he didn't want to be seen as this. And maybe he's coming to this in himself. And he was drawn to me because he felt that in me, like I could be a safe person that he could. Um, so anyway, so then he avoided me for the rest of the training. And he said that he, um, uh, what did he say? He's like, I don't identify with that orientation, but he's like, I'm, I'm too shy to tell you more about this right now. So he's like, maybe we can pair up again and talk about this deeper. 
and uh and then we never ended up connecting so i shouldn't say he avoided me the rest of the training but he didn't come to me i guess um so anyway so there was something in there like and i'm i'm a, i believe in my intuition like i would say 99% of the time i'm right there's 1% of the time where i'm wrong and it has it happens and uh but i do believe in my intuition um so when when it comes to gaydar i would say you know a lot of the ones that i that i picked here are from the c the C category versus the feel, because the feel for me is hard to describe. It's just this, it's like a magnet. Like it feels like, I don't know, there's something around that. It's hard to put into words, but I see, you know, when I'm looking to, to tell if somebody's gay, if, first of all, it's a huge spectrum. You know, if I were to use a marker as a stereotype, it would be that gay men tend to be more feminine and in touch with their femininity, whereas straight men aren't. So that's usually the first marker. But what I'm realizing is that there is a massive spectrum amongst heterosexual men. There's very masculine presenting heterosexual men, and there's some feminine presenting heterosexual men. And then gay, it's the same thing. You have very masculine presenting gay men and, and some feminine presenting um, gay men as well. And so I want to just recognize that this is where that is. There's the faux pas in that because you can't base femininity and you can't make an assumption that somebody's femininity is, a, is an equation to their sexual orientation as a whole, as a stereotype. Yes. Is there truth to stereotype? Yes. So I wanted to just point that out. Um, this is probably a, a bias of mine because of this, the, the arena that I play in, but sensitive men, I see a lot of sensitivity in gay men a lot of the gay men i work with are sensitive i see sense or gay, gay men as more conscientious uh, than straight men this is an assumption that i have because i find that a lot of gay men uh care a lot about like you know people and and you know suffering and these sorts of things i just see this i see a lot of compassion within gay men so i equate that like a sensitive man i i would question i'd be like is this person gay or queer or um or whatnot and I also recognize that I work with sensitive men um, and I work with a lot of heterosexual sensitive men. So there, again, I can't base that off of anything. Right. Um, and then the way they dress, like clearly, I think that's one of the biggest ones. Like I think you, there's this term metrosexual, which is like, I'm straight and I dress like a gay dude kind of energy. But I think of the way a, a gay guys tend to dress gives them away like short shorts, like above the knee is like, yeah, he's gay. You know, there's the walk. You can tell the, the way the, the little, you know, walk, well, a gay walk. <laughs> it's like, it's just a thing. I can, I, I have it myself. Like I can feel that. Um, and I don't see a lot of straight men wearing like short shorts. It's just not a very common thing. So attire is a big one. Um, gay voice, another quite common thing that um, guys with lisps or the way that they talk and can, you know, definitely, which it makes me curious about like genetics of being gay. Like, I, I think people come into this life with that voice. I don't think they're trying to have that voice. And it's like, makes me wonder like the genetic component of being gay. It's, it's, it's very fascinating to me. Um, and then the last one is about attraction to me. So <clears throat> I have a three look rule to determine if somebody's gay or not. So if I go out and I see a, a cute guy and he sees me, the first look is like a size up. Like you're sizing me up. I'm sizing you up. Like straight men do it all the time. Women do it to each other. It's like, who is this person? Second look is like, yeah, they're attractive. Right. But just because somebody thinks you're attractive, it doesn't mean that you're, they're gay. Third look, I'm like, mm, okay, I'm starting to think that maybe you're actually physically or sexually attracted to me. And there's a possibility that you might be bi or gay, right? If they continuously check you out, that it's likely a sign that something's up. Um, so those are just some of the things that I, that I use. And I guess, you know, I, I want to just, I, even just speaking them, I see the holes in all of the things that I just shared, right? Like that's the whole point of, of, you know, why we wanted to do this episode is to show that, you know, so get more curious about each other instead of just making these assumptions. We, it's so beautiful. And this is why I love authentic relating is like, I learned so much about people. And in that training, I had a story about everybody and we play this game. Like, what's the story I'm telling about you? And like, when I came in and we're all sitting in the circle day one, I'm looking around and I'm like, oh my God, I will not jive with this person because they're this. And I'm just like basically sizing everybody up. And, uh, and it's amazing after the course of the weekend, it's like a lot of people weren't who I thought they were um, in the way that I thought they were going to be. So it's just interesting. Yeah. You know, a <clears throat> few things came up while you were speaking. 
Um, one is, and I just posted about this the other day on my Instagram stories, how I thought it was so funny that like, you know, the, the, the things that let's say, um, gay people or, um, even like black people were like reprimanded for in terms of like style and expression have all been like over time co-opted by by the like the very people who oppress them initially mm. which i find so fascinating <laughs> it's like the guys who would have been bullying me for wearing a crop top years ago they're all wearing crop tops now you know <laughs> or tight shirts or like all the stuff we've been wearing they're wearing the necklaces we would have been wearing they're wearing like all of it they're all wearing it right and i get it it's like bless your heart you had to catch up with us because we're ahead of the <laughs> curve we're ahead <laughs> of the curve you know um, are you talking but, about within the gay community or are you talking about straight guys? Outside, doing straight gay? guys outside oh, of okay, it. Yeah. 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 Um, but, I don't think I've but, ever seen a straight dude wear a crop top. Oh my goodness, it, honey. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh yeah, for yeah. sure. It's like all, That's yeah. So it's like a thing now for sure. Yeah. yeah. Even so, things like wide, earrings like, pants, and tattoos. Crop tops, yeah. The earring. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All the stuff. It's And so you don't funny. think those people identify as queer? No, they don't. Or like though. gender no. fluid or anything. No, oh, no, interesting. they don't. Yeah, that and that's what I mean. Like, it's just, yeah, there's a lot of fluidity these days. And yeah. and honestly, to be honest, I just think, yeah, they're catching up. You know, they're, it's yeah. like we knew. We knew it was all cool. Yeah. Um, but I want to ask you another question. Yeah. How do you know that they're straight? Because we can use gaydar to determine gayness, but we can also, like, how do we, how can we assume that those people that are wearing crop tops are heterosexual? So two right. things, two things. One, um, what you talked about, feeling and intuiting is hmm. something I definitely leverage. Um, but the other piece is uh, I don't. Like, hmm. I, I don't. I generally will not, I'm not saying in the background, my mind isn't trying to do math to figure it out. I'm not saying that isn't <laughs> happening. It's just like, I'm, it's so sort of secondary to the fact that like, I'm just not, I'm just like, if I want you, I want you. I don't, I don't know. I'll, until I ask you, I don't know if you're gay and I <laughs> generally won't like assume it. Yeah. Um, let, let me rephrase that. I will assume that, I have a chance with you that I can, we will probably sleep together if I want to until you reject me and tell me you're not. Right. So that's kind of how it works for me. But I, yeah, there's still this sense that I can kind of tell even when people are wearing certain things, like I can tell you're gay and I can tell like you're probably gay and I can tell you're probably not. And it's a feeling it's like a, mm -hmm. an intuition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And, and the last thing I'll say is I think one of the reasons why well there's two more but one of the reasons I struggled with this episode so much initially I think is because like I have always struggled with being boxed in like mm -hmm. I I swear I came out of my mom's uh <laughs> vulva like just just like you cannot tame me like I am me and constantly throughout my life like it's like oh you're this you're that right. and I'm like well yeah but no you know mm -hmm. yeah but no so I think that was it for me. I was just like, well, what does that even mean? Like who I'm me, I, what do you mean? You know? Yeah. 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 I have some things I want to add too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we yeah, thought we were going to have anything to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, I love Reno adding the word probably, like you're probably this and you're probably that. Even just yeah. adding that word helps because it leaves yeah. wiggle room because of course there's always going to be exceptions and we, we yeah. don't actually know for sure, right? Yeah. Um, so a couple of things. One, the concept of the, the 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 cultural aspect of it. We have to look at this in context, right? So here in Toronto, which is I would say a very metrosexual city, and probably other urban centers, like I'm thinking of, I've, I've been to Spain four times. I've been to Italy four times. Mexico City was just there. Guys who wear the shirt that I'm wearing, like this lacy, transparent kind of thing, and this chain, straight guys would totally wear this in these other yeah. places not even yeah. think twice and they would like and yeah but here or maybe in another if i went to you know church wearing this <laughs> they'd be like oh that's the gay guy right mm -hmm. so we really have to look at the the context of the cultural aspect of it and what totally. we're used to and, and where we live yeah. um, and then the other thing i was going to say specific to my gay desire or my gay gaydar is what gets in the way for me is desire i will like want someone to be gay because <laughs> i'm attracted to them yes. and so my brain will convince me oh yeah oh yeah this for sure this guy oh yeah, yeah this happens to me a lot at the gym um so yeah those are the two two things i wanted to mention 
Yeah, it's funny. I just wrote that down. I swear we have like tele telepathy or whatever you call it. Um, yeah, desire can affect Gator. I wrote th those exact words before you even said that. That's uh, yeah, it's true. And how many times have I been skewed by that? It's like, oh, he's so hot. Like I, you know, I bet he is, or or these sorts of things. And we play up the story, and then he like goes and grabs his girlfriend's hand, and I'm like, oh. And then the opposite has happened. Like I'm telling you, if if I if I had this filter, like if I was if I was trying to see things through this lens, most of the guys that I hooked up with in high school and post high school, I wouldn't have hooked up with because all these guys, for all intents and purposes, if you looked at them, if you heard them, even if you were trying to intuit, you would not have thought that they were like down to have sex with uh, uh, another guy. You yeah. know, like. Yeah loads of them you know yeah yeah yeah. <clears throat> yeah and again i think that spectrum that i talk about too is it's like you know people that are fully fully gay like sexuality is a spectrum so where do we draw that line right like if somebody you know sleeps with men or women will say 99 percent of the time and one percent of the time does that make them gay or does that make them buy? Or like, you know what I mean? Like, I just, it's, it's such a, I think that's where people have a hard time with all these labels is it's like, you know, why can't I just be a sexual being that, right. that moves towards whatever desires I feel in that moment. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's also people that find safety and like me, I'm somebody that finds safety in it. Like I'm 100% gay. Like I have zero desire to be with women. So it's like, I find safety in being able to say I'm gay. I like men. Men is what I move towards, you know? So, yeah. Um, all right. So question two, Mr. Michael, uh, is there anything you do to make your gayness more known? <laughs> what about, Hell yes. what about, what about hiding like, your gayness? It's like, who are you asking? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love it. Um, I mean, everything. And I love the way that the word gayness sounds like anus. <laughs> it's just, I giggle. Anus. I giggle every time. I'm so, I'm so yeah. mature. Okay. Gayness. Is there anything I could do? Yeah, of course. Of course I do. Yeah. I mean, everything that we just talked about, right? Like I, yeah. I can, if I want to present myself the way I want to be perceived, um, yeah. if I want people to know that I'm gay, uh, then I, I, I will do that. I'll, I'll wear certain clothes. I'll walk a certain way. I'll flail a little bit more with my arms, even the way I speak. So, you know, Matt, you had talked about gay voice. I can turn that on and off. And I spent so much time in the closet as I'm sure many of us did, knowing and being very hyper vigilant within ourselves of how we are talking and what we are saying and like yeah. just constantly scrutinizing ourselves. So I've learned how to do that. Um, and I can do that again. So if I go to, let's say, again, I'm traveling somewhere and this is not necessarily a LGBTQ safe space, I will definitely be able to turn that right off and turn that down and tone that down. Um, so I can hide it when I feel like I, when I feel like it's a safety thing. Um, and what I would do there, again, it's everything we just talked about, right? So I would probably slow down a bit more, maybe deepen my voice a bit like this. Uh, mm -hmm. This happened to me when I was in my, I talked about this in my corporate job, my nine to five job. It was a very much a boys club, corporate environment. And I did for a long time, code switch, I guess is the term, but like just try to hide the aspects of me that I maybe wouldn't normally or that I didn't really want to. Again, mostly out mm -hmm. of safety. Um, so what are some things I do? Yeah. I mean, definitely the clothes, like the clothes I choose, that's number one for me and the way I speak, uh, again, I'm very animated. I like talk with my hands, um, and I can have that gay voice. I can totally turn that on if I wanted to. And I do, and I'm with my friends. We're all, we're, we're that crew, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So I think those are some of the, the main ways. And then I'll, I want to say what I do going back to like sussing people out. When I walk into, I'm going back to the, my church example, when I'm kind of sussing people out, I'm looking at like, these are all, these are all general generalizations and stereotypes, but I'm just going to make it known. Okay. I'm, I'm owning up to it. Not to say that they're right, but this is just what I do. Okay. Um, I will assume older men are dangerous and perhaps homophobic, especially anyone maybe over the age of 60. I'm like, oh. Okay, that's definitely not a safe person for me. So yeah. I'll kind of like hide my gayness a bit there. Again, feeling unsafe. Yeah. If I see a young woman, I will assume the opposite. Oh, a friend, an ally. Yay. Is this true? Hells no. This is not always true. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Sometimes they can be not allies at all. But again, if someone says, oh, you know, I'm from some rural town up in the boonies, I'll be like, oh, 
okay, danger, danger, danger. If someone says, oh, I'm from Manhattan, I'm like, oh, cool, you're good. But mm -hmm. again, none of this is true. This is just yeah. stuff I'm making up in my head based on yeah. what my notions of, of what I see in the world. So um, yeah. these, these assumptions are always happening and they happen in the reverse way too. And based on what I sense, then I either turn on my gayness or I shut it right down. Hmm. Hmm. I want to share impact of your share because I think there was something that struck me uh, when you talked about turning off and on. What did you call it? You called it code, code switching. Code switching. Code code switching. switching. So yeah. oh, I can even feel it in my body right now. That is such a, a trigger for me with gay men. Um, and I, I, I just had a moment of feeling triggered, but I also had a moment of compassion because I know we have had to learn to do this to survive and it's an adaptation. It's an adaptation for interacting with people that we might deem as not safe. So it could be more so like probably heterosexual people. But when we do that, well, I'll speak for myself. When I do that, it bleeds into re intimate relationships too. So this code switching or this, this ease in being able to hide self, that really triggers me about, about our community because I find it really hard to relate to people that hide and it, it, it inhibits the type of intimacy that I want. So I'm just recognizing there's a part of me that feels like activated by like this adaptation that we've had to have as gay men and how that has served us, but it's also, it's robbed me. I'm not going to speak for the people. It's robbed me of the experience of being able to really see each other as gay men in this deeper, more intimate way. Like, <clears throat> you know, and because I also do see then this other side, it's like, well, when I'm with my gay friends, I'm going to be extra gay and I'm going to use my gay voice so much. And I find that's a bit inauthentic too. So it's like the hiding is inauthentic and then the overcompensating is feels inauthentic to me as well. And I just like, I yearn for this real kind of juicy, authentic place where it's just like, we can just fully be ourselves and not have to like act or play out these, these, these parts. But there's also a part of it that has so much comp compassion for us and like how resilient that is to have to actually be this way in a, in a culture that is it's quite dangerous to be fully ourselves. So, yeah, I'm just noticing these two parts of me really alive right now. Yeah. Well, we are a minority, gay people, <clears throat> queer yeah. people. We are a, a big minority. Like if you look mm -hmm. at the population of the world, so that minority stress comes with this vigilance that we just have to. And you're right. It is it is yeah. it is protecting safety. Whether it's conscious or not, I mean, for me, it definitely comes from years of being in the closet and again, just being hyper aware of how I'm coming across and how I don't want to be perceived and how I do want to be perceived in some spaces. So yeah, it's uh, that, that vigilance is always there, I think. Yeah. 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 What yeah about you, wow. Um, <clears throat> well, present for me, there's my experience is that, you know, I sort of came out of the closet when I left my mom's vulva again, right? And there's a, I'm talking about my mom's vulva a lot here. <laughs> hey, mom. Um, and, and like, I was just, I was me. I was me. It was like I was authentically expressed. And then, you know, and then at some point I started to see, okay, like, um, me being me elicits this response from this person, this response from this person, this reaction from this person, this reaction in this space. And I'm assuming my my mind and that, you know, this whole like whatever all of this is started doing mental gymnastics and math and kind of figuring out like, OK, I'm I can be me here, but I can't be me here, you know. I can be this much of me here, but I can only be this much of me here, right? Mm -hmm. And so there was this whole process, I guess, you know, related to safety, security, love, belonging. Um, and 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 so I think what I probably started to see is like, okay, in these places, I'm going to tone down the fullness of my authentic expression. And in these spaces, I can just let it rip. And then there was another layer of that where it sort of became this act of exploration and rebellion where I went like, you know, first I went completely the one, you know, the opposite end of the spectrum in one way. It was like toning my gayness down. You know, I remember I went and like, I I was really trying to sort of fit into this um, 
this like butch straight like gangster kind of box that the people around me wanted me to put wanted to sort of put me in and and I tried it on and like my being just rejected it you know it lasted about a week maybe you know if that like just barely I was like this is not me let me get this off um and then I went to the other end of the spectrum when I came out which was like you know bought the cover girl you know, the, bought the like to exist sexy underwear and tank top and was like doing all the things. I was on the float at the parade and these little yellow speedos in the matching tank top, like dancing it up. And like, it was amazing. It was fantastic. Um, and I had a good time. And then somewhere in all of that, I found my way back to center, what, like like a place that fit for me. And, and I feel like that's the place I find myself in now, you know, which is, which is where, generally speaking, I'm expressing what occurs to me as it occurs to me, um, as opposed to, as opposed to kind of like, and I'm not saying I get this right completely, of course, like, I, it's a, it's a journey, it's a process, but, but, you know, like, I will wear what I wear. I will say what I say. I will be what it occurs to me to be. And and then just, you know, navigate whatever that brings up in my environment accordingly. Mm -hmm. So that that's kind of what it looks like for me. And what I can say is, you know, the question was around making your gayness more known or hiding your gayness. And what I can definitely say is, yeah, like initially as a means of creating safety, security, belonging. Yeah, like I would tone it up in gay spaces and tone it down in less gay spaces, right? And and this was this was probably very necessary in a lot of ways and still might be in certain parts of the world as well and in certain spaces and environments to really like know how to code switch, you know? I think that's where it comes from. It's like, um, you know, you might not get hired if you're too black or too gay or whatever, right? You might they you might not be welcomed. You might not be befriended. You might literally be caused physical harm. Your life might be at risk, you know, yeah. if you don't know how to code switch. So I really empathize for, as you said, Michael, you know, the minorities and like how we how we have been forced to move into this world or move in this world, um, you know, until until um I, I suppose until we started really rebelling essentially is what we had to do we had to rebel it's like we're here we're not going anywhere um and and we're you know this is this is it this is what you get so mm -hmm. I, I don't even know if I answered the question I sort of went on my yeah, own tangent in a way but but that that's that's really what's present for me around this yeah 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 thanks Reno thank you um yeah, this question was hard for me too. I didn't really write anything down. I just figured I would just authentically relate around it. And yeah, I I think, um, what's the question? Is there anything you do to make your gayness more known? There's a part of me that's like, what is my gayness? Like, what does that even mean? Do you know what I mean? Like gay, being gay, being homosexual means I have sex with other men. So it's like, you know, is there anything I do to make my gayness more known? Well, yeah, like, I'll be like, hey, I'm gay. Like, do you want to have sex? Or like, you know, putting that out there. So there's the actual thing of like what it means to be gay. Like, and then everything beyond that is just a thing that's been tacked on to what it means to be gay. So the, the parts of me that I would even make that correlation would be playfulness, you know, being playful and like skipping around and again, being feminine, that f this whole thing around femininity plays into this so much for me um because but but it's not when actually when i think about it those qualities like they're human qualities when people are joyful they're enthusiastic and they want to skip around if somebody just wins the lottery if you see the most masculine dude win the lottery like i bet you you're going to see some things that people be like oh are you gay right we it's funny how society creates this bridge between these qualities um so I don't know. There was, there was, there's a hard, it's hard for me to answer this because I don't grab on to those things. I, 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 I like, you know, that you see like the traditional things people do in the gay, gay community. I, I don't grab on to those. Those aren't the things that I've grabbed onto that I've identified as a gay man. Like, so like if I go on a gay hike, does that make it gay? Like with other gay men, is that a gay thing that I'm going to, you know, 
so I just find that these qualities are just, it's just so interesting how, how we have this. So I want to like re continue to reclaim that, that my gayness is just about who I sleep with. It doesn't have to be about any of this other shit that's that people have slapped onto it. Right. Um, which the typical ones are like, um, like the gay voice, the flipping of the wrist, like all these stereotypical things that we see around being gay or the gay walk. Um, but then I also think sometimes people in our community, they grab those and they run with them because they're like, maybe it's like a lack of sense of self. So they grab onto what the community is saying, this is what it means to be gay. And then it perpetuates that stereotype, right? If that's authentic to them, I think that's wonderful, right? But if it's like per doing it just to perpetuate the stereotype, I would like, like part of me like kind of questions that, you know what I mean? Um, and then what about hiding my gayness? I think, again, pro probably I would say I would have to answer it through the parts of femininity. I'm still reconciling the parts of me that are, that feel uncomfortable bringing forth those more like expressive parts of myself, like the really flowy, like dancing, singing, like all these, these, these things that I've been conditioned to believe make our, our birth out of the feminine I'm still making peace with some of those things um so I would say geez what do I what would I hide around that yeah I can't really think of anything that I think about it like I think um contextually like I, I feel like I'm trying to think of this authentic relating weekend um was there a part of me that felt like I had to hide And I don't think so. Like, I feel like I was just pretty, pretty myself. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'll, I'll put some more thought into this, but, but I really don't think um, there's anything about my gayness that I would be hiding. I used to, um, when I was younger, and I think I've told this story before, is I used to um, control my hips. <clears throat> I was walking in front of a group of girlfriends at the time, I was probably 14 years old. And they're like, one of them said out loud, look at the way Matt's hips walk or waddle or wait, his hips sway when he walks or something like that. And I was like, oh, fuck. So from that moment, I was like, okay, walk rigid. Don't let my hips swoosh. And then funny enough, I'm working with a practitioner right now that does structural integration rolfing, which by the way, is amazing <laughs> for anybody out there looking for some body work. Um, and he's in, he's in, like encouraging me to like sway my hips. He's like, go for a walk every night and walk with a, a hip sway. He's like, who cares what people think? He's like, your hips need to learn how to move fluidly and uh, it'll help with like lower back pain and getting the spine moving uh, again and things like that. So, um, so that was a piece. And then I think when I was going through puberty, making my voice deeper, um, that sort of thing. Like I really did not want to sound gay. And I remember when I was going through puberty and I would hear myself on little recordings or whatever, I thought I sounded gay. So I would try to not sound gay and things like that. But I've, I feel like I've reconciled all that stuff. I don't really, I love being a gay man. I, I, I actually hope that I reincarnate as a gay man in my next life. Um, that would be fun again. You know what I mean? I, I think there's a lot of, of beauty about being a gay man. Hopefully I don't have to go through all the struggle that I went through in this life. Hopefully my next soul is like, okay, well, let's start from where we end, you know, and I get to just live the liberated gayness. Um, cause I love being a gay man. I really do. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Snap, snaps for that. Yeah. Snaps, snaps for, for that. that. <laughs> yeah. There, there's, um, I, I was, I wrote something down while you were speaking. Mm. Um, and I thank you for sharing the piece on rigidity as well, because like, if that ain't a metaphor for so much of what's going on here, I don't know what is, you know, it's like, yeah. there's this, you know, it, these people say this thing, you experience this sort of trauma, if you will, and then it impacts your hips, and then your like whole body and how you express yourself. And to yeah. be honest, that's a microcosm of a macrocosm. I feel like oh, that's yeah. what's going on in the world at large, right? And it's why we're like sick and, you know, just, oh, anyway. Um, the the other piece was I, I'd written down like gayness, blackness, wokeness, queerness, et cetera. Like they're all celebrations of authenticity as I see it and, mm -hmm. and aspects of the whole that the majority has neglected or rejected um, both in themselves and in the world, right? And so that's kind of how I look at this is just like, you know, in, in honoring and highlighting these aspects, gayness, blackness, wokeness, queerness, et cetera. It's like, we are creating space for the whole, 
you know, and of course there's going to be pushback from people who have rejected that in themselves. Right. Yeah. So, um, and then also within those spaces, let's, let's also acknowledge the fact that, you know, th there are people who are like, oh, you're not like, you're not gay enough, Reno, right? Or you're not black enough, or you're not woke enough, or you're not queer enough, right? Or you're too queer, or you're too black, or you're too gay, right? So it's like, in some scenarios, you just, you can't, you can't win, right? But mm -hmm. what I would say is, nobody gets to decide that for you. Exactly. I get to decide that for myself. Yeah. We get to decide that for ourselves. You don't yeah. get to tell me whether I'm gay enough, or too gay, or black enough, or too black, or whatever. Yeah. But like, mm -hmm. I'll decide that. Thank you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good for you. I love that reclamation because I've seen people even leave comments on some of our episodes about and it runs around race and like this guy's not even fully black or <laughs> what does he know or these sorts of things. And I'm like, what? Okay. Like, where do these well, we can talk about it. You know, send yeah. me an email. Hit me up. Yeah. Let's talk. Uh, we'll yeah. chat. It's just people projecting their own crap. Oh, I know. That's what yeah. it all is. And I'm is. here for it. It's like, yeah. come with it. Let's talk. Yeah. 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 All right. Anything from you, Michael, or you feel complete? I feel good. I'm uh, I'm happy we had this conversation. We didn't quite know where it was going to go. And as always, uh, it went in wonderful, wonderful places. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Cool. All right. Well, um, if you're not already, come join us in the Gay Men's Brotherhood on Facebook. Uh, we'd love to have you there. We're almost at 9,000 people. That's a lot. Wow. Great. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, please subscribe. Leave us a review um on apple or spotify whatever you're listening to us on it does help us give us a five-star rating if you enjoyed what you heard comments on youtube again we always try and and uh respond to them and they're what i what i'm finding actually is they're really useful for other people to come in it's like a community the community goes and interacts and stuff so your comments aren't just for us they're for other people um as well mostly i would say for other people like people read them and, and want to interact with them so drop those comments on youtube they're important uh, come join us for our connection circles so the second Thursday of every month. And uh, you can find all this stuff on gaymensbrotherhood.com website. So come see us, come visit us over there. All right. Much love, everybody. Stay gay. <laughs> <laughs>